Greetings. Uh, today we're considering the church in Thyatira, the church with mystical tendencies. And this will be in the, in the closing of chapter 2. And thus far it will be our fourth church in Asia Minor that we're considering, or uh, more properly speaking, uh, more literally, these are all messages which are to be sent to the angels of those respective churches, real churches at that, that time, but in their totality, they also represent the uh, all of the churches and the church universal from different angles at all times. So it's always relevant to us and to our situations in, uh, in greater or less extent, as the case may be. But they all have their relevance to us. So starting uh, in Revelations chapter 2, verse 18, it says, And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, This thing saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass, or burnished brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works. And the last to be more than the first, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into bed. And them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not, ha have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depth of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh, and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father." And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Well, may the Lord also grant us the ability and uh, to have those spiritual ears to hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, even in where we're at right now. So... Um, this address to the church in Thyatira. Now, Thyatira was a town or city uh, lesser in significance than, for instance, Pergamos, um, which was, you know, kind of uh, a larger city with many entertainments and businesses and such like. So the congregation there, as the text indicates, enjoyed relative peace, at least in so far as that no persecution is mentioned from external enemies, no external pressure, at least that is, uh, uh, it's not mentioned here uh, in, in contradistinction with the church at Smyrna, which was severely persecuted. And um, so the, again, the heading is significant because each time the risen Christ, the Lord of glory, when he gives this particular message to a particular church, will designate himself with a, a different metaphor of which refers to his either power or divinity, immortality, something that is stressed. And since it uh, must have been the case that it's not uh, futile, that it must have some relevance to this situation, that this aspect is emphasized. In this particular case, it says, These things say the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. We remember that vision 
from uh, the first chapter of the book of Revelation where John turns around to see who's uh, speaking to him and he sees this uh, a very sublime vision, the uh, seven candlesticks in between them walking like into the Son of Man, but who's very uh, uh, very interesting in the description and um, even fearsome his appearance is such that he drops at his feet as dead because he's uh, had his uh, hair, his uh, Head is white as snow, is the whitened wool, the expression is in the Greek, and his eyes like a flame of fire. And his feet also are blazing and are looking like unto a burnished brass which came out of fire. Again, the picture of one who's come out of that fiery furnace of God's wrath, vicarious wrath which he undertook in our behalf. So, um, this thing saith the Son of God who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. So, the vision here is the one who underwent this great vicarious suffering for his church. He really tasted death and even drank the cup of God's wrath for his elect. So, that aspect is stressed here. He's come out of that fiery furnace of Nebuchadnezzar, as it were. So he proceeds, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. First, as the, as the custom is of the Lord, and we should be doing likewise, he says good things, so he lists commendable features of that congregation at Thyatira. He says, I know thy works, of course he does, he is omniscient. I know that works in charity and service and faith and thy patience. These are all good things. And moreover, he says, he adds again, thy works very active in doing charitable works, maybe feeding the poor, uh, taking care of, you know, the poor and destitute and providing homes, maybe shelters, uh, giving soups to the homeless, that sort of thing. But it also the last works or the expressions of love are greater than the first. So the church is actually growing in her devotion to her Lord. So these are all commendable features. But if we look again at the description, it's interesting that in the list, he says, I know the works, it generally it means everything that you do. I'm aware of that. And it says, in charity, in service, and faith. Faith is listed the third in line, whereas the charity or love, because that's what it means, but it's this, this agape that God love, which is enkindled by the Holy Spirit or shadow brought by the Holy Ghost. This love comes first in this uh, list, on the list. And that's significant. It may be telling us something, that this church was of such a character as a congregation. Of course, not everybody in it was that way, but it certainly was a characteristic of the church as a whole. The tendency was to be very active in loving the brethren and loving thy neighbor as thyself. So it's very charitable church. Again, uh, uh, in contrast, with the church in Ephesus, which was the first one to be addressed by the risen Lord of glory, the church at Ephesus was good at standing the ground against false apostles, false prophets, and very orthodox in its profession, its confession. Really good at defending the gospel or its orthodoxy, but it was woefully lacking in the first love, which is primarily expressed through the love to the brethren. And we can even uh, observe instances of this even today, that there are some very orthodox churches. I mean, you hear them, everything that little out is yes, 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 and amen, but that there's something missing. And, what, and one thing that is woefully and sadly missing and sometimes is the lack of love to the brethren, 
and to thy neighbor in general. And sometimes it's very conspicuous, very, I mean, you're just aware that there's uh, such coldness. And you kind of ponder, how can that be? A church can be this orthodox and yet so not loving, as was the case with Ephesus. But here we have the completely opposite picture. We have the church very active, very loving. The charity is first, and service, and faith. Faith is really third. So very active church, and also patient in that, because he says, in that patience and that works. And the last to be more than the first. All of those things are good, but we're already... We begin to see that there may be some problem with their activism and there may be a lack in something in which the church at Ephesus, Ephesus excelled, namely orthodoxy. They must go together because we read of this, uh, of the following scathing denunciation of the Lord, and there's a fearful one because he says, uh, notwithstanding. I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants. Now, um, most people, uh, those who comment on this text, uh, take the position that there's no reason to suppose that there was not an actual lady who was uh, promoting such things. But since the name is almost certainly figurative, just as uh, most of the things in the book of Revelation are of the symbolic nature, okay? Not to be taken literally. So Jezebel, of course, reminiscent of that wicked uh, woman. It was, the, of course, the wife of that uh, wicked also king of Ahab in, uh, in the northern uh, kingdom Israel. So she was notorious in persecuting the prophets of God. And she was after Elijah. Remember, even Elijah was scared of her because she was uh, infamous in that regard in persecuting God's people. She's also interesting that uh, she, was, uh, she was into this uh, beauty making thing. So the only description of, the, of uh, doing the makeup we have is of that uh, woman Jezebel. She was into this uh, making herself attractive sort of business. So the name is probably figurative. Nevertheless, whether whether this is a particular woman in the church or maybe that is the whole other, some other congregation, which is, you know, with women in the book of Proverbs and elsewhere, the bride of Christ. I mean, they have those feminine designations for the churches because, uh, because of the union with God or with Christ, so therefore they're appropriate. So the woman could be taken as a church, which went out of the way and became uh, very charismatic in a sense, with this uh, very pernicious tendency to uh, kind of search the depths of Satan, maybe teaching them, to really find out how deep our sin is and on the way also realize how great God's grace is. So she's probably typifying this accusation against those who believe in grace. Let us do evil, as Paul says, that good may abound. But whereas Paul says, may it never be, this woman or messengers of her, of that church, as the case may be, were prone to teach. Well, let us just search it out. So let's uh, take a closer look. Well, some obvious things we must observe, of course. He says that I have a few things against it because thou suffers that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, but is not, obviously, to teach and to, to seduce my servants to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed unto Idols, some things uh, already reminiscent of the uh, situation of the church at uh, Ephesus and later on the church at Pergamos, uh, the era of Nicolaitans. Again, we see if things sacrificed unto idols and commit fornication. 
And I took it rather spiritually in my last expositions that uh, the application to us is any spiritual deviation can be designated as a spiritual fornication. Point of fact, James, in his epistle, calls the professing church predominantly Jewish, because he was writing to a predominantly a Jewish audience, that uh, adulterers and adulteresses, because don't you know that uh, friendship with the world is enmity against God? So against it, he doesn't mean that everybody was committing real uh, sexual acts of sexual immorality with somebody else's partner. What he was saying is that uh, if you are into the world, you're committing this spiritual fornication or adultery because you're already married. Therefore, it is adultery. So it could be taken that, but we shouldn't exclude the literal meaning either because this is probably the time of the early development of that heresy which became full-blown in the 2nd and 3rd centuries known as Docetic Gnosticism. It has a self which is well Docetic as far as Christ just appearing to be human. And the other aspect of that was it was through the knowledge. And see, knowledge is an interesting word in Scripture. Remember the tree of the knowledge of good and evil right in the garden. Right at the uh, uh, outset, we, we see that picture. And man decided to take that path of finding out in their own experience what is good and what is evil. And sure enough, they went that way. So knowledge, there's also knowledge in the intimate covenant acquaintance that the Lord has for known his people. Of course, he knows everything beforehand, but he for loves his people. But here, knowledge is about um, uh, about searching the uh, depths of Satan. In the opposite of that pernicious experience is to take your knowledge or to find your knowledge in Christ and Him crucified. This is the design for all Christians. We're not to take our own paths. Well, let's find out what it is. No. We're to trust God and what, in, in what He says in His Word, because in Him is found all wisdom and all knowledge, as per Colossians chapter 2. He is the great resource of all wisdom and knowledge for us. But apparently this woman, let's take... The position that there may have been an actual lady. Herman Huxema, who wrote a commentary on the book of Revelation, he speculates that, that it could have been one of those uh, prayer meetings at that congregation. Maybe he's, you know, he, he admits that kind of, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm projecting the 20th century realities into the pristine, the New Testament church. We, we don't know how they did it, but uh, let's suppose just for the sake of just uh, us supposing that uh, you have a sort of a prayer meeting and people sharing their experiences, what to be thankful to the Lord and so forth. You have young people saying, yeah, the Lord is so good. He's keeping us and he's given us all these good things to enjoy and all of that. And then some old man stands up and says, uh, yes, I also have many reasons to thank my Lord. And tears have fallen down his uh wrinkled cheeks and so forth, because he's been faithful to me all his decades, despite my own unfaithfulness and disobedience. He knows my wickedness. Nevertheless, he's so faithful and so forth. So you have all those uh, things sometimes which uh, take place in uh, meetings other than the Sunday worship, for instance. And then this woman stands up and she says, well, I'm also thankful to the Lord because he appeared to me in a vision and he led me into this and that. And she's kind of looking attractive and very spiritual. Um, and uh, so people begin to listen. She And he showed me so much that we can actually experience and taste the beauty of the Lord. And with many such things, she probably begins to have her way into seducing and tempting the people of God 
who are less than, uh, less, probably less steeped in orthodoxy as the church in Ephesus. I mean, take the epistles to the epistle to Ephesians. I mean, you have two chapters, high Calvinism and refutation of dispensationalism. It's a great ecclesiastical letter, but it's full of high Calvinism. I mean, uh, no wonder that it became so stalwart in its orthodoxy. Nevertheless, they left off their first love, and therefore they were in a, in a dangerous position as well. But here we have a, the opposite uh, picture. So, so that's hoaxing of speculation. And at first I read and I kind of smiled to myself, oh, maybe here's uh, on to something. We don't really know. But uh, what we do know is what the text says, that somebody was seducing, teaching and seducing his servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. The latter part, eating things sacrificed unto idols, we shouldn't exclude the literal uh, application, I mean, significance either, because at that point, it was a big thing. That's why Paul mentions it twice in the letter to Romans and in 1 Corinthians. He devotes, uh, you know, bunches of verses to discuss eating things sacrificed unto idols because it was a huge problem at that point. Now, for us today, as I said uh, earlier, it is probably the ecumenical gatherings and getting ourselves aligned with churches or movements which are hostile to the gospel of free and sovereign grace. That would be also eating things, sacrifice unto idols in our time, in my, uh, uh, in my opinion. So here we come to uh, a difficult uh, place. It used to puzzle me a lot. L the Lord says, and I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. And I gave her space. And our Russian Bible simply says, I gave her time. Now, this is more little, though. It is a space, a space and time. And I thought to myself, look, being a um, hyper-Calvinist, it's hard for me. What's the point of giving time? Doesn't that uh, create an impression that, well, if the Lord gives you time or space to repent, uh, so it uh, must not only be your bounden duty to do so, but it suggests almost an ability to do so, right? I gave her time to repent, and she didn't repent. What's wrong with her? So the Armenians, of course, latch on verses like that, but uh, we must remember that simply giving time and space to repent does not of itself mean that the one of whom that uh, repentance is expected is able to actually produce it. And uh, it's done all the time. The long suffering of the Lord with the people of Israel and with the creation at large, there is an aspect of this long suffering that even in uh, Romans 2, I believe Paul talks about that uh, God's goodness led thee to repentance. So it is meant, in the New International Version, even uh, inserts their interpretation, which I think is correct, but it is an interpretation. It's not a translation. That's why NIV is so dangerous. It says that, uh, O despises thou the riches of his goodness and forbids. This is Romans 2, starting from uh, verse 4. Despises thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? not knowing that the goodness of God lead thee to repentance. See? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures, treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. So it used to puzzle me. It doesn't anymore. I mean, I... I understand it's almost, it's, it's like Paul says, look, how else could God judge the world? He deals with us as with rational, reasonable creatures. And reasonable and rational creatures are, are dealt with on this level of being rational, reasonable. God says, look, 
it is reasonable for you to stop committing this crass fornication. Even your conscience testifies to you that it is wrong, and you ought to stop doing that. So that sort of thing, and he gives you space to repent of that particular sin. So it doesn't mean that he works in you effectually that grace of repentance, which always is a free gift of God, as we understand. So it is to expose the gracelessness of that woman and of her, uh, actually of those who follow her, her children as they're called here. He says, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and then that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. So basically he is... Uh, the Lord Christ is uh, giving this warning that she shall visit this woman and her followers with severe and dreadful punishments, even punishing them with death. Will cast her into a bed, probably a sick bed or sickness which is unto death. We can't be sure, but this is a severe uh, judgment of God. So, again, what is it that particular error that she taught? It was evidently to search out, to know the depths of Satan as they speak, as he indicates in verse 24. As many as have not this doctrine of this woman in which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak. So the quest was to find out. And uh, the title of this message was The Church with Mystical Tendencies or A Band for Mysticism uh, and, uh, on, uh, on Facebook uh, stream. So this tendency for mysticism played a bad joke on this congregation. Now, We've been already into two-thirds of the message, and I haven't even discussed, well, what is this mysticism that you're talking about or not? And we must have some idea and some agreement on what it means. Now, mysticism, as especially as it is employed in Christian theology discussions, is a term which means experiences which are not immediately or directly connected to the propositional knowledge or belief in those propositions in the Bible. It is some sensual or emotional experience that may accompany your knowledge of the propositional truth in the Bible, which comes through your mind, or it may sort of come apart from that, or may pass. We have, in point of fact, some scriptural justification for a healthy mysticism. For instance, this famous injunction and admonition that uh, to open thy hearts and minds in petitions and prayers to God in, in Philippians 4, and the peace of God, which passeth all knowledge, it says, shall guard your hearts and minds. So what is promising here? The peace which surpasses a knowledge. So a kind of greater than your knowledge you will experience in your walk, in your Christian walk, this peace. Now, it is a blessed thing to truly taste or Come and see, uh, taste and see that the Lord is good, as in the psalm. So again, these things suggest that uh, experience is important, uh, that we, it's not just the head knowledge, that we actually experience God's goodness and sometimes even feel His special and blessed presence in our lives. So that is called 
mysticism. It can be very healthy. In point of fact, there must be some measure of mysticism, of experiencing, tasting, and relishing uh, Christ's goodness, God's goodness to us, being faithful sometimes, even tearful and joyful. All those things must be there. It's not just the ability to formulate the correct orthodox formula. You must have all those things. But the tendency, and that's because of Satan, he always tries to separate that which God has joined together. So he tries to lead people away from orthodoxy, calling it dead orthodoxy. And since we do have sometimes instances of that, hard as, uh, as it is for me to digest that because I'm on the part of being probably, at least my tendency is to be whether or not I am, in fact, orthodox. It's not for me to decide ultimately, but I want to be as orthodox as I can possibly be. At the same time, sometimes I, I think I'm missing on this practical uh, experiential side of the Christian walk. But nevertheless, Satan comes and says, look, forget this doctrine thing, the theology books and so forth, they're dusty. And they lead people into hyper-Calvinism. Therefore, just drop it. Just do your loving thing and uh, uh, have uh, protracted prayer meetings and uh, lovely hymns and uh, and that sort of thing. And just get emotional and get swayed with uh, whatever is in your heart and do it with all your might. And so people pervert, uh, pervert the scriptures uh, for that um, reason. So mysticism gets separated and even divorced from the right doctrine. That's where trouble begins. And that was the case with that church. Through this woman, or maybe a group of people in her name, um, people were taught, look, uh, it's probably what they taught was that since the body is going to return to dust, Thy spirit, your spirits have been redeemed by the Lord. Your flesh is in, incorrigibly evil. It doesn't matter what you do in your body. Look, it's just incorrigibly evil. It's the body of death. Paul himself says, well, this is the body of death that I'm carrying around. Oh, wretched man I am, and so forth. And since you do not do what you want to do, therefore just uh, let it go and try to just Search out the depths of Satan, find out, and yeah, commit whatever you want to commit. At the same time, you sort of, you see the dark side, but you also see the bright side of grace, which covereth all things, and the love which is always there for you. And therefore, that was what they were probably teaching those people. And, um, and therefore, they were using grace as a pretext for uh, committing uh, fornication, anything sacrificed to others, to lasciviousness, to lawlessness, the pretext for lawlessness. In Jude, we'll probably have the same situation because Jude talks about the same thing almost. So, so the Lord is threatening with judgments, and he says also, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts. So probably it's going to be something big. Something that uh, their ears are going to be ringing with the sound of it. So some dreadful judgment so that other churches will know, boy, did you hear what happened to Thyatira's congregation? Boy, you're not going to believe it. So, so something that's going to be really big and frightening. But unto you, I say, verse 24, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which you have already, hold fast till I come. That which you have. What do you have? The gospel. Christ's doctrine as it says, well, basically the gospel and all things whatsoever I have commanded you, as in the Great Commission. So it's basically all concerning 
Christ's person, his work, and his, yes, imperatives. His imperatives. He's not only our priest, but also our teacher, our master. We are to follow his imperatives. And he's in no wise promoting lasciviousness or lawlessness. So, um, you know it. Just keep at it, saith Christ. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him I will give power over the nations. About keeping the works, I won't say much except I will repeat. Keeping the works of Christ, it says, keep my works, he that keeps my works unto the end. What are those works? It is basically his commandments, which are not grievous, which are loving believing in Christ and loving one another. It is the law of Christ, if you will, but it's not like unto the law of Moses. It doesn't condemn you. It's not a set of commandments which are against you so that if you stumble at one point, you become guilty of all, and it becomes a ministry of damnation, ministry of death. No, it is the law of Christ. You've been loved, well, go on loving your brethren, and doing good to all men, especially those of the household of God. And so you, you get the point. So keeping those works, gracious works, unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers or to pieces, even as I received of my father. Now, we get this uh, uh, metaphor from, of course, Psalm 2 most notably, Thou shalt dash him in pieces to the Messiah who's been enthroned and placed upon the holy hill of Zion. Thou art my son, remember Psalm 2. Thou shalt dash him ass of me and will give thee nations for thine inheritance. I've already talked about that at length, rather, at uh, when expounding Psalm 2, that this is an evangelical promise. Now, while there is a an aspect of just punishing disobedient nations and those who are actually disobedient to the end. It's basically we ourselves need to be broken as vessels before we're able to receive that pardon and grace. So breaking us to pieces through the crushing work of the Spirit as plowing the soil is a blessed work of the Spirit. So as to bring us into submission to the obedience of faith. So that's an evangelical promise. So what he's saying is, that it's not that, oh boy, you got to be just judging and be beating people over the head. No, what he's promising is that if you get corrected on this point, which I, I just shown you, you will be empowered to do the work of evangelism as a result of which you will be bringing people into subjection to the gospel of the grace of God. It's an evangelical promise, all right? Even as I received them of my Father. And I will give him the morning, morning star, which is representative of 